Okay, so on to titanium, which I think is awesome because titanium is, for the most part, HCP. And I like HCP metals, right? Because HCP metals are really interesting because oh, they twin from a deformation perspective, right? They have a tendency to be brittle. They have, they have twinning. They have um, uh, um, a mess of slip systems. Deformation is quite confusing. They also potentially have lots of phase transformations. Um, a really cool thing, I don't, I don't have it here, um, but they also have uh, high pressure phases that stick around. Right? So regular uh, alpha titanium, commercially pure grade two titanium is all HCP. If you heat it up, you transform to beta, beta phase, which is BCC, so another lower symmetry. So even in the high pressure phase, deformation is quite is not super straightforward because you've got a mess of different subsystems, right? And you've got a lot of plastic and elastic anisotropy in both systems. You also have uh, thermal anisotropy, thermal expansion anisotropy in the HCP phases, so you have a lot of thermal stresses you have to you have to deal with. And then if you keep it at low temperatures and you heat up the pressures, you go from hexagonal close packed to the omega phase, which is simple hexagonal. And we'll talk about omega phase because you can also get omega phase in different alloys. Right? But it's so it's a hexagonal, but it's uh um not close packed hexagonal. <coughs> so it's a you got a weird preponderance of crystal structures. Right? And you have all kinds of really just cool things happening. You also have relatively large volume changes between alpha and beta. So you also have transformation strains that you have to worry about, right? Because you have stresses induced by your phase transformations because you got these these mismatches. So lots of stuff going on, right? The nice thing about it, right, these are just basic physical properties. Another really awesome thing about titanium is you've got a huge amount of elements that make substitutional solid solutions with, with titanium. Right, your alloying compositions are are your possibilities are really large, right? Which is interesting because what titanium alloys do we use for most things? What are the two the two alloys that everyone in here knows? What's that? Ti six four and Commercially pure grade two, right? Or grade two and grade five if you're an automotive engineer, right? Grade two means commercially pure. Grade five means I-64, right? And that is almost everything that's used in titanium except for aerospace, particularly certain aerospace applications, is a mix of those two things, which is uh, either one of those two two things, which is really interesting because we have a huge design space in titanium that we really haven't taken too much um, uh, advantage of, right? And then we also have oxygen and nitrogen, which sit interstitially, right? And oxygen and nitrogen are really interesting because they really screw with our plastic deformation, 
right? We have very different plastic flow behavior and formability based on our interstitial content. So, um, yeah, it gets things get things get mucky and messy really quickly. So we'll break. Uh, we'll talk about alloys in terms of um, alloy. We'll have a list of alpha stabilizing elements elements that are beta stabilizers. And so we'll generally break the alloys that we're going to be talking about into alpha and near alpha, alpha plus beta alloys, and beta and near beta alloys. All right? And then you can have uh, alpha plus beta processing of alpha alloys and all these weird <coughs> kinds of combinations. Okay? So why do we uh, why do we use titanium? Why is titanium of interest? Right? It's high strength to weight for the most part. Right? So that's one aspect. Corrosion. Right? Right? Very highly resistant to corrosion. It is so far, the only biocompatible metal, well, austenite, so certain grades of austenitic stainless steel, right? But if you have surgery and they leave something behind, like a pin or a screw or a new knee, right? It's titanium for the most part. Right? And very slow diffusion. So if we can be in the hexagonal regime, we can have also very good uh, creep resistance. Right. Okay. So slip. So what are our primary slip systems? In HCP, well, we have what are our close packed planes, right? The basal planes, right? And our close packed directions. So that's a natural slip system, right? What other planes have the close packed directions in them? The prismatic planes, right? The 1O bar 1O planes. All right, which one of these does titanium prefer? Any idea? Prismatic is easier in titanium, zirconium, hafnium, beryllium, right? And we'll talk about why in a little bit. Magnesium strongly favors basal. Slip is much easier. But in general, what do we know about these? If we are loading along the C direction, C axis, the C crystallographic axis is orthogonal to both of these planes. Well, so be careful about what I'm saying. The C axis is orthogonal to both of these crystal directions. So the Schmidt factor on both of these is zero. So that means we have to consider other slip systems, which are more difficult to activate, that can uh, accommodate deformation along the, uh, the C-axis. So we have to consider slip on pyramidal planes, right? So here's the prismatic plane and the slip direction, right? And so in pyramidal one, we have the one, one, bar two, three 
directions, uh, slip directions, right, which are not close packed, which are not close, close packed slip directions. So what, what in general do you think that's going to mean? What about how easy, how hard this is going to be to activate relative to prismatic? Is there going to be a big difference or are they going to be relatively close? Resolve shear stress. The, this is going to be a lot harder, especially at room temperature, to activate. Right? What about temperature dependence of the slip system? What's that? You have a non close packed slip direction, much a larger burgers vector. No, no, no. This is just. This is showing the direction. That's not the actual slip direction. The slip direction is one one bar two three. Yeah. All right. So the right slip directions are right. There's also other perimeter slip systems, which right. So these. This is going to have a much stronger temperature dependence. So at higher temperatures, this becomes much easier. This isn't going to change too much, right? So depending on the temperature, we're going to have very different modes, uh, slip modes activated, okay? And it's hard to see here on the screen, but it's very, because it's, it's a bit small. But you can see that there appears to be kind of a trend with C over A ratio of hexagonal metals and which is the easiest basal versus prismatic slip, right? And so right, if we look at cadmium and zinc, which have smaller than ideal C over or larger than ideal C over A ratios, they're basal. Magnesium is close, it also is basal. And then zirconium, titanium, beryllium, which have smaller C over to A, C over A ratios, uh, slip to or change to prismatic. Zinc is really interesting. Um, Um, no, not zinc. I'm thinking of, um, uh, tin. And it's a, off the, it's a divergence. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a, uh, take a pass on the story. Um, okay. So, so for the C plus A slip, the prismatic slip, right? So the um, pyrrole stress for these dislocations is much larger than for. Um, the prismatic dislocations, right? The, these are just the, so in general, the nomenclatures, we call these C plus A dislocations. These are A dislocations, right? So if you look at the literature on deformation in hexagonal metals, you'll see that all the time. You'll see C, C slip, C, or A slip, C slip, C plus A slip. All right. And... So we can see that um, there's this really a strong temperature dependence of both of these uh, slip systems. In general, basal starts out harder 
then C plus A. Then as you increase, prismatic actually gets harder than basal. At higher temperatures, basal becomes harder. And the relative ease of C plus A um, gets better, gets easier as well. Right? But it's all very highly nonlinear. And then the interstitial oxygen <coughs> really screws with this, right? So if you look at the interstitial content of 0.01%, we can see that prismatic, as a result, shear stress of about 14 MPa. If we increase the interstitial content by a factor of 10, it goes up to 90. But the key thing is look at what the ratio between prismatic and C plus A pyramidal gets much closer, right? So the effect of interstitials doesn't cause a big change in the strength of this uh, nearly as big of a change in the resolved shear stress for C plus A slip as it does for A, right? So generally we would consider things like this in the range of commercial purity, right? So depending on the, within the range of, of uh, commercial purity titanium, Finer compositions can also be considered in the range of commercial purity. So you have to look at these things very carefully. As you can imagine that these big changes in relative slip resistances is going to give you big changes in your formability uh, and your manufacturability of any parts. Okay. So this is a slide I, I took from David Dye at Imperial College of London has a, a whole course on uh, uh, deformation in um, uh, hexagonal and hex hexagonal processing, right? But the interesting conclusion that he, he throws out there, and I want to put a big caveat on this because I don't necessarily... I wouldn't state it quite so strongly because there's exceptions, right? And this is, this is like holds true for high purity, like five nines pure metals, right? Like that zone refined titanium, zone right magnesium. This definitely holds true. But in the use, I wouldn't quite, in, in actual materials we use, I wouldn't go quite so, so far as this. But he makes the observation that as the C over A ratio decreases, hexagonal materials become more ductile, right? And why does he say this? Well, if you look at the uh, the interplanar spacing of of the uh, basal planes. Right, this decrease essentially means that <coughs> the C plus A Burgers vectors get shorter, right? And we know where Burgers vector enters into the pyro stress, right? So <coughs> the lattice friction gets significantly less as this uh, as your C plus A as your C plus A ratio decreases. Okay. Um, if that were the case, I mean, if this were, if this were a hundred percent true, that would mean that omega titanium would be super ductile, right? Because it's C at C to over a ratio being simple hexagonal is much less. C is much less than a, right? And in fact, Prismatic C is the slip 
the easiest slip mode, but it still has a resolved shear stress on the order of gigapascal plus, right? So it's very brittle. So that's that wouldn't this doesn't hold this kind of a hard fast rule, but the prismatic plane with the slip the, <coughs> the slip direction, the burger's vector direction is 0001 in omega omega phase. So the 10 bar 10 plane 0001 slip direction. So pure C slip. Okay. So to make up for this lack of ductility, this lack of easy modes in for C-axis deformation in hexagonal, a lot of hexagonal metals twin like crazy, especially in pure state. So commercial purity titanium ends up with a lot of deformation twins. Alloys like TIE 64 do not, this generally holds across all HCP metals, pure magnesium twins. When you look at it, AZ31 does not, right? It's very, very difficult. You have to go to high strains to get AZ31, right? So there's a whole range of possible twin systems. All right, the most common, all right, 1, 1 bar 2, 0, or, or oh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 bar 1, 2, oh, 1, 0 bar 1, 2, I'm getting my, flipping my, my indices, but this is the most common mode, and notice what it does the rotation associated with the C-axis, right? It's roughly a 90 degree reorientation of the C-axis of your crystal. So if you have a crystal that is in a hard orientation for C-axis compression and you deform it and you deform it by twinning, the twinned region is now a plastically soft region, right? Because now you have easy activation of prismatic slip within the twin, right? So you have a huge amount of um, uh, anisotropy that occurs due to twinning, local hardening or local softening due to the activation of twinning, right? These are often referred to as um, um, uh, tensile twins. They have right they they're going to occur when you're pulling on the c-axis, right? Uh, so you'll sometimes see see that uh, in the literature. Right. Remember, twinning is is directional, right? So if you uh, um, were to load the c-axis in compression, you wouldn't get these twins. You'd get one of the other uh, uh, types of twins. Okay. And so again. We have lots of cross hardening between twin and slip systems, right? Twinning gives us very large, very rapid uh, texture development and very rapid amount of work hard. Right? So then, in that's deformation in HCP in BCC. We have a hodgepodge of subsystems as well, right? Just like we did for uh, BCC iron, right? The slip direction is going to be one half one one one, right? But we can either glide on the one one zero plane, the one one two, 
or the one, two, three uh, type planes, right? So we have a huge amount of potential subsystems for, um, for BCC, and they all have very strong temperature dependencies. So whichever is easiest might be different in different temperature ranges. Right? And I think we will actually stop there because then we'll get into some alloying, alloying stuff. So we'll stop a little bit early today and uh, 